In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer questions that are asked by listeners like you. Uh, they go to our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. They post the question under the qua meme. In our comment section. We pick the best ones and then we answer them. And the way we open this episode is with a uh, fun conversation. We talk about current events. Fun, fun, fun. Studies um, and our lives. So here's what we talked about in this episode. We open it up by talking about Adam's injury. Damn yeah. it. <laughs> this guy's always hurting himself all Dang. the time. Is it because he's too strong or is it because he's old? Ooh, <laughs> then, we talked the to, then we talked about the show Mandalorian on Disney+. Plus. We're all loving it. Uh, I talked about my daughter's 10th birthday. Holy cow, they grow <laughs> fast. Double digits. Yep, it's getting scary. I talked about heavy metal, not the music, Yeah, but heavy metal toxicity. Oh. Um, it's kind of hard to test for that. Doctors typically won't test you for heavy metal toxicity. Um, but you can do at home testing for that and other things. Our favorite company is Everlywell. They have hormone tests. They can test your vitamin D levels, for example, uh, men and women's tests. And they also have a heavy metal toxicity test. Now, right now, you can get 25% off all of their tests. Now through December 31st, here's what you do go to everlywell.com and use the code Mind Pump. Then we talked about blue light and its effect on melatonin and the anti-cancer effects of melatonin. Believe it or not, low melatonin levels has been tied to increased rates of cancer. And being exposed to blue light right before sleep reduces significantly your melatonin production. Not a good idea. Now, one thing you could do is turn off all your electronics two hours before you go to bed, or you can wear really nice quality blue light blocking glasses like the ones that Felix Gray makes. Now, the thing about Felix Gray glasses that we like is they don't turn everything orange. And they're cool. The glasses are actually clear, but they still block blue light. Uh, and we have a hookup for you. Starting November 25th, they'll have their biggest offer of the year, 15% off site-wide. So it's kind of cool. This offer will be going on till December 4th at midnight. Here's what you got to do. Go to Felix Gray Glasses. That's Felix spelled F-E-L-I-X. Gray is G-R-A-Y. Glasses spelled as you would normally spell glasses. Dot com forward slash mind pump. Use the code mind pump to get hooked up. Then I talked about how many touches people need a day to thrive. I need a lot. <laughs> so. Justin's always asking to be touched. Not enough. Then we talked about ultra processed food and its ties to obesity and chronic disease. We talked about CrossFit's new direction. Sounds like a, a boy it's band. A boy band. <laughs> oh, oh. And how Google now acquired Fitbit so they can watch everything you're doing. Ooh, big brother. Then we answered the questions. Here was the first question. What is the significance of body weight training when you can just lift weights with lighter weight and do higher reps anyway? Like, why do body weight training at all? Why? We give you the reasons. Next question. Uh, should someone who's a beginner focus on building or cutting first? How do you know which one you should do first? So we break that down for you. Next question. What's the deal with these days? Why is it so hard for people to lose body fat in this day and age? So we talk all about modern life and why it promotes squishiness. <laughs> That's yeah, the word what's for the deal with all that fat? Obesity. And the final question. How do you know when you should become a personal trainer? Like what makes you fit to become a trainer. So we break that all down. Also, this month, we have our own big promotion, probably the biggest promotion you'll ever see. Oh, it's massive. MAPS Performance is 50% off. So MAPS Performance is our workout program. It's great for building muscle, burning body fat, but it's a functional athletic performance-based workout program. So the exercises are different. The workouts are fun. Um, you get to build strength, speed, agility, it's a great program, one of our more popular ones. It's one of our core programs. It's half off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsgreen.com. Make sure to use the code GREEN50, G-R-E-E-N-5-0, -E no space, for the discount. Dude, I watched this uh, this little documentary on uh, Disney+, Plus because they have Nat Geo. I know. I'm sold. A little cute one. It was about dogs and mm. how we've bred them, you know? Yeah. And I was just laughing because they show... <laughs> Think the original dogs were like wolves, you know what I mean? And I yeah. think to myself, like, how many 
How many dogs now, like if you left them in the wild, would they be fucked? Yeah. You know what I mean? I thought what, about, what is I th- a chihuahua? I thought of Adam's dog, you know? <laughs> yeah, my dog. Do they, do they bang a rat? Yeah. Like, <laughs> what? You know, somewhere, you know, in the line? <laughs> no, they just bred them to be cute. And I was thinking about Adam's uh, loud ass, snorty dogs. Like, those poor guys would catch, they would have sneak up on any prey. No, they would not. They would not, <laughs> actually. Yeah. 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 Their, best, their best hope would in- intimidate another dog that went out and got something. That's, yeah. What, yeah. They, that's what they're taking care of away from. Yeah. The, from the and even then, if they had to chase the other dog down, they're fucked. Yeah. They just hope that, A lot of these dogs are screwed. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Why are you moving funny today, buddy? Um, why, why are you wrapping your, your leg with a bunch of stuff? It's all Man, covered in a gauze. Bit of hitch in your step. Man, I'm so bummed about this right now. So the irony of it was I texted you guys last night at like, I don't know, I think it was around five or so. And there's always a lesson in these things. <laughs> yes. I feel like it's coming out right. <laughs> <laughs> it was like at like five o'clock or so, I sent a message to you guys. I just finished up my five sets of squatting uh for legs and maps powerlift. And I'm 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 super pumped, right? I'm in chucks, we got no belt, squat is deep. And uh, 261 is like moving like butter for eight to 10 reps. And just. And your text was like, fucking, you did a little devil face, like, yeah, I'm squatting yeah. like a champion. Yeah. yeah. Feeling it. Just feeling just so. Taunting us. Yeah. Feeling yeah. so good, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, some of the best I've ever felt. I mean, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the program and, and, and watching the progression right now. And uh, I get to the part of the program where we, we're walking lunges are at. And at this point, I mean, I'm already got a nice leg pump and I'm not doing super heavy weight. This is the same weight that I've been doing every week. Uh, I just hold a 50 pound dumbbell. So I got a hundred pounds, right? I'm doing walking lunges, which is not like super crazy heavy. I'm not like struggling to do it. Um, and I'm on my second set and I go down and I hear as I'm coming up out of the, the lunge, something pops. And I feel pain in my quad. I drop the dumbbells, fall to the ground. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I did one of those. T-shirt time. <laughs> <laughs> and Katrina like whipped her head around. Are you okay? And I'm like, and I'm laying on the ground, roll over like once or twice, grabbing my thigh. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. And she's like, is it, are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. I think uh, I just strained something. It didn't feel like, I don't think I tore anything. Although today... It feels like I got fucking ran over by a truck. There's no discoloration. No, no, exactly. So I'm okay. Was I, your I, was your kid in the room? He was. Oh man, I know he saw. He saw that. You, he saw, he saw that. Yeah. He saw Dad scream. I hopped up and pretended like it was yeah. nothing. Yeah. Though, real quick. Oh, I'm fine. There's snipers yeah, yeah, in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dad's fine. Dad's oh, fine. Dude, uh, age. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> this happened to me a couple times uh, before, and it's it's a really weird feeling. I get it in my left, only my left quad, um, and. I, I mean, I remember after the first couple times it happened to me, uh, and this was probably like four or five years ago. It was when I was training to get into competing, so it wasn't, I wasn't even competing yet. And one of the things that I, I thought it could be from is dehydration. I wasn't drinking enough water. And so after I made a point to make sure that before every lift, I had at least a half a gallon of water in me before I – especially when I was squatting and training – um, uh, it never happened again to me and it, cause it had repeated a couple of times. And at that time I wasn't tracking my water. I wasn't doing anything like that. I began to really uh, push uh, my water and take up. And then I never had a problem with it again. And the irony is my birthday was, uh, this weekend and I ate like an asshole and, you know, I had pizza and dessert and all kinds of shit, just probably, uh, uh buttloads more sodium than what I'm used to taking in over the, through the weekend, uh, late around in the morning time, uh, didn't really drink much water, maybe had a glass or so and didn't, wasn't even thinking about this. And then I did, uh, was training legs. Um, and so I'm assuming that it has something related to that again. Was it the trail leg or the front leg that popped? That's a good question. When that happened, let me think here. If it was, the no, 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 it wasn't the trail leg. It was the front leg. Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. And it's in the middle of your thigh. Yeah. Wow. It's happened before. It's happened. If, like you Is said, it a hip flexor. Uh, does it, it hurt to flex at the hip right now? Yeah, it it does. Um, it does hurt. Like it's it could it could be a hip flexor. I don't I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's my rectus femoris. I definitely think it's a it's a smaller, deeper muscle, 
And and again, I, I think I just strained it. It's not torn. I don't have any major bruising. I, I hate walk, injuries I like that, it. man, because they're so boring. You know what I mean? Like, it's not a good story. <laughs> it's not. It's you know what not. I'm saying? Like, and I was using appropriate weight in lunging. Yeah. Oh, well, that makes you feel you dumb. You didn't, like, chainsaw part of your leg or anything. Yeah, it's no. not like, it's not, it's not like, that cool. oh, I hit a PR and it hurt my leg. You no. Know, you're kind of happy about that. No, it, that's just it. it, was, it was, and it was towards the end of the workout. I had plenty of rest. I, all I could point to is... Is is the water thing because I had this issues I had these same issues before when I knew I wasn't drinking enough water and when I m- made, started to track and started to carry my water it makes a difference. Yeah. I've experienced that before. Yeah, I, I've experienced the stiffness that you mm-hmm. get from mm-hmm. being dehydrated, and I've also tied it to um, muscle pulls, yep. where I feel like I I pull muscles easier because I'm a little bit dehy- or not optimally hydrated. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. That's I mean that's the only thing that makes sense to me and. I, what I can't remember because it's, I know it's happened a few times. I can't remember how long it takes me to kind of recover from it. It doesn't feel like it's going to be more than a week or two. Uh, so I hope it's not like a. It's gonna. I hope it doesn't set me because I'm seeing great progress right now. It just would fucking piss me yeah. off right now to to get this right in the middle of this program right now. You ever so. hurt yourself so bad that you lay on the floor for like a couple hours? <laughs> Ever couple, happened to you before? Not a couple hours. <laughs> happened to me. Oh, really? Yeah, dude. Uh, years ago, I was reading, you know, I like to read old articles. I like to read all articles around strength training, but for a second there, I got really into old school strength training and an exercise that the old timers really uh, valued was a, a pullover, dumbbell or barbell pullover. There was like a big movement and they would actually brag about how much weight they could lift with the pullover. And one of the variations of a pullover was, was called a cross bench pullover. So you got the bench, you lay across the bench so that your upper back is on the bench and maybe a little bit of your head and neck. And then when you lower the dumbbell back, you kind of drop your hips a little bit and breathe in and expand your rib cage. So Arnold used to say, this is a rib cage expound, expander. And that's, that's not really what's happening, but it does give you this insane thoracic kind of stretch as the dumbbell lowers and your hips drop. Plus, I was reading again the articles about how strong they were. So I was, how old was I? I was in my 20s. And I'm like, oh, cool. Let's see how strong I am. So uh, I used a 150-pound dumbbell. Ooh, that's pretty serious weight there. And yeah. um, How old were you? I was late 20s, maybe, 28, yeah, 29. Okay. after it. And I was able to do uh, six reps on the first set and then drop the dumbbell, and I was all proud of myself. Second set, I'm by myself, by the way. So I'm in my personal training studio. No one's in there. I used to play loud death metal, lock the doors. It was just me. I lower the dumbbell and I feel right in my like mid upper back. Mm. And I, I went, huh! like I couldn't breathe all of a sudden. Huh! <laughs> and I dropped the dumbbell and I just, huh! and I yeah. kind of rolled over and laid on the floor. So, oh, man. yeah, it's the only, first and only time I ever got scared because I laid on the floor <laughs> in the fetal <laughs> position and I laid there and, and, Took me thirty minutes to finally be able to catch my breath. I'm like, wow, oh, man. <sighs> so I laid there, and it took me two hours. Finally, was able to barely get up, and I called my chiropractor buddy, and he said, "Yeah, we're gonna try and pop your rib back into place or whatever." And so I went and saw him, and he popped me back in, and again, <sighs> lost my breath, and then it got it got better, and it took me like a couple weeks. But that was the only time I've ever been on the floor and thought to myself. Someone's gonna find yeah. me on the floor here. Is this okay? Because that's yeah. the only way. <laughs> that's the only way I'm gonna. Yeah, I was I was laying there for a minute, not quite that long. Uh, uh, and Katrina was constantly. I was trying to be tough, like, nah, I'm fine. It's gonna be okay. Because your son's there. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I'm okay. I'm okay. Daddy's fine. But inside, I'm not. I'm, I mean, honestly, I'm like afraid to stand up and put weight on. And I'm like, oh god, please. You know? Yeah. Only time I think when I was playing in a game, I was in St. Louis, and it was like. 100% humidity on top of being like 90 degrees out. And so I was already like sweat like 10 pounds before I even got to the field. And so I was like seeing things like I was like so dehydrated and I was like drinking and everything, but I was like so beyond dehydrated before I even got there. I started like running full speed, you know, on kickoff. And then I, I had my first hit and it just like rung my bell. And then I kept trying to play. And then in the huddle, all of a sudden I started to just get lightheaded, dizzy. And then I kind of fell and passed out. And then, <laughs> And they, they were like trying to revive me and ask me all these questions. And I was just like completely out of it and had to sit out the whole rest of the game, but just was on the sidelines, just like completely confused. That uh, sucked. Those are shitty feelings. Yeah. You know what I mean? But so it's, that's the it's, only time. It, the, the crappy part is when you hurt yourself and then 
because you know. You, you yeah, know, now I'm going to be scared the next like couple weeks. Yeah, that's the part that I'm. I'm more. I know it's not that bad. Like I know it's not like my Achilles tear or anything. That's you just know be. it's going to take time. Yeah, and, oh. and I know that when I go back to squat next week. I'm not gonna want to like here. I just had to be in your mind too. Is totally, you, is you going through it? Totally. Yeah. So that's yeah. kind of that part of it is the. I think the real frustrating part is like that's could, the bear of these kinds of programs where you're trying to push it. You yeah. know, like uh, that's just like especially now or uh, you know like all these like little signs and things. And well, speaking and to you, the things that piss me off. It's always stuff that I know better. Like yeah. I, I know I, I like I learned this lesson already like five six well, years you're ago. Learn it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fuck you. I mean, Not all the way. The lesson was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> it just yeah, hasn't yeah, been learned yeah, yet. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I've for sure have learned it now, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it seriously has happened to me, uh, and it, each time it's been like uh, there's, there's a spectrum of how how bad it's been, um, and I would say this is on the on the worst side. Uh, of the times it's happened, but each time of the weight I've dropped and had to bail and then was kind of limping home after that um, and limping the next day, which is what I look like today. Uh, but it's always that was I would go home and I'd be like researching everywhere. What could this be? It's not a tear. It's not what am I what am I doing? And trying to figure out what it what it was and why there like. Yeah, the only thing that makes sense to me is again. I was. I don't think I was drinking enough water. I don't know, man. I don't know if we'll ever learn those lessons. You know what I mean? It's like <laughs> yeah. when, when when Rocky's talking to Adrian. Remember that? <laughs> She's like, "You got. You can't yeah. win." You know, I'm an. I'm a warrior. Yeah, yeah. I can't <laughs> help it. That's who I am, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> Terrible advice, by the way. Yeah. If you live yeah. by that, you're gonna fuck yourself up. Oh, every 100%. single time, dude. You guys watch uh, Mandalorian second yes. episode? Yes. Did we? <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask Justin this. Like so twice. Uh, first of all, I, I absolutely love it. So I think it's phenomenal. Yeah. It's a um, great show. What, what are your thoughts being like, like a, a, a weird super fan is when you see like, <laughs> thank so there, you. Oh, I will take that. Is this something you appreciate or is it more annoying when you see things that are obvious parallels to the storylines in previous ones? Mm -hmm. you, do, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. for example, like, um, you know when he goes in to get the 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 sand people, they take his they take they take his, th his all yeah. his stuff. Mm -hmm. Then he goes into the inside the cave, and then the uh, the rhino yeah, comes it's very out. Very reminiscent of a New Hope, yeah. Right, right. So there's a lot of parts that I'm like, oh, that's like the same. They're doing that on purpose, though. yeah. Yeah, they're bringing nostalgia uh, back into it for for like I guess the older fans. Okay, yeah. so that's what I'm asking. I'm at like that's what I was, I'm watching it. I'm going like, okay, so. Are, are, do like super fans get annoyed by this because they're like, oh, it's lazy writing because it's um, like the same story? Yeah, sure. There's, yeah, dude. There's a whole like different species of of these nerds out there that like have ownership over the story somehow, you know. And I'm like, calm down. Like you, know, like there's there's all this energy uh, in terms of like, well, we want to see it go in this direction. We want it to evolve. We don't want to see the same like story and the same plot and the same environment. And, you know, so I think Lucas, he was trying to do that. And then when he was doing that, he was getting crucified for like using, uh, you know, new characters and, and like trying experimental things and more CGI and all this kind of stuff. And so I think that like the predicament is like, Star Wars like got acquired by Disney, and so now they're trying to appease the, the 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 core fan base, which you know a lot of them want a lot of what they remembered out of the first kind of Star Warses, and so I think it's smart that way. Yeah, so they're kind of more appealing towards, I guess, the less extreme uh, super nerd fan base. There was uh, there was like one myself. there was one thing though that I wish that they didn't like show again. Like there's one robot that I don't remember which original Star Wars it was in, but it's obviously a dude walking inside of a little robot show. Oh, yeah. You know what yeah, I'm talking about? Yeah. And you can see him like, like, yeah. like oh, it's so fake. Left or right. And they yeah. had another one. Yeah. You know? like, oh, God. <laughs> but see, it's definitely like a throwback it. to the old Star Wars. I like it over, I don't know what it is. I guess it's the, it's somewhat of, you know, it's it's somewhat like messy, but you could tell like it's real actors uh, yeah. with costumes and I don't know. I, I tend to, I like the artistry more uh, with, with like masks and costuming and things like that over CGI. So the less CGI for me, the better. And mm. so I, I guess I, I appreciate uh, like, cause it, it makes it feel a little more uh, raw and like, like unfinished. And um, like that, that was one of the things about star Wars that was different than all the other science fiction movies out there was it's, 
it's not like perfect. Like the gat, like there's all this like junk and stuff that people are putting together to make spaceships. And it has its own feel too. Like the yeah, technology. It's like gritty. Yeah, it's like a combination of like new technology, old technology, religion. Right. Yeah, I think it's 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 brilliant. Obviously, I'm trying so, to get my kids into it, but they're not they're not getting into it. it uh, yeah, it, it's funny because I mean they're adding in some old elements like with you know the the whole little Yoda guy, and hopefully like people don't get pissed about spoilers, but like he. With that, that there's this whole thing with that where uh, like George Lucas wasn't ever going to talk about his background, uh, Yoda, like where he came from, like all that. That was like a big no no, and so the, like nerds are getting upset about that. So that's uh, one thing because it was supposed to be a secret. For yeah, him. so like they're they're kind of putting that in there and creating a whole another story, uh, you know, with us, which I'm excited about because it's something like I don't know where they're going with this, and I'm I'm like here for the ride, you know. It's so far so good. Now, do you guys like the model of releasing an episode once a week better than the Netflix drop them all at the same time model? I mean, it like selfishly, I want it all right now, but uh, I see like I, I honestly, I think it's better because uh, then I can anticipate, and it is kind of like promoting a little bit more like energy towards seeing the next one. It's probably more discussion and speculation, I would assume. For yeah, sure. I would think. For I sure. Think else so. everybody pinges the whole thing and, oh, yeah, I've already seen it. Be, oh, I'm done. I yeah. get annoyed. I want to watch it all. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. ready to watch yeah, all I think of it's good for me, though. It like, helps kind of put like a reserve there. Like, well, that's, uh, yeah, for me, I think it's a it's a healthier way to do it because I am the same way, too. Like, if it had the whole season, I would have already binged the whole thing. Totally. For sure. Yeah. I would have yeah. watched the whole thing. Spent, you know, eight to 12 hours yeah. watching television yeah. over the course of a weekend. Yeah. Or this way, it's like, oh, I have a couple shows right now that are on apple plus and, and disney plus right now that i i can only watch one episode each each so, week so you guys don't watch rick and morty huh because the new episode came out again are you guys watching that at all no i was you gonna check watch it out it. yeah you have to buy like the whole season though dude so. you gotta watch rick hulu do you guys have hulu no how about you adam well it, it's included in disney plus hulu is yeah no yeah. but you have to buy them through the disney plus oh okay yeah, yeah that's no, why I, have I was gonna watch i it, have it but, dude yeah. it's such a good so good it's like sci-fi cult uh, hilarity! It's just such a good cartoon. My, my son and I just piss our pants. Yeah, the old ones. I liked. I liked them a lot. For and sure. they're 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 terrible. They're and they're terrible still. Rest. They're coming out with new seasons still. It, the new season just came out, mm, which yep, is yep. Yeah, really really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this this weekend was um, my little girl's tenth birthday. Dude, it's crazy to wow. me that she, I didn't. I, how how we not put this together that it goes Katrina, me, and then her all all within yeah. a day. Should have a super party. All Scorpios. Yeah. Yeah, dude, it's really cool, man, seeing it's because it, it's funny. All of a sudden, she's started to mature. You know what I mean? And I can see the transition from little girl to teenager start to happen already, which is terrifying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's super, super terrifying. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Um, but we had a great dude. My, my ex-wife had the party at her house, and so it was my parents, my – my bro my ex brother in law, my brother, my sister, my parents, you know, it was Jessica and I, my ex wife and her boyfriend, my kids. And it was just one big awesome family. It was so nice to see everybody together and it was just really, really cool how it was all it's all coming together really well. It's a really, really good time. She's still dating the same guy, huh? She is. They, yeah, he's a very nice guy too. He's from Arizona or something like that? Utah. You, and they still long distance doing that, huh? Yeah, yeah, but they, they he, she comes out uh, once or twice a month, and he'll stay out here for like a week. Oh, okay. Because he can work remotely. Really nice guy, really really cool guy. I got to talk to him a little bit more um, this last time. Super calm, which is probably good. Um, <laughs> that's know? probably good. Yeah, you know that's a good, yeah, it's a good thing. You know, my kids have a lot of passion on the other side, so they get the, <laughs> the calmness on that side. Um, but no, it was a, it was a great time. It's just cool watching my daughter with her friends because she had to sleep over the night before. Yeah, and you watch these little because I've she's grown up with these these girls. They've all gone to school together. Yeah, watching their conversations start to change a little bit. Uh, like it's getting to the it's gonna get it's close. Pretty soon it's gonna be boys. That's all they're gonna talk yeah. about. What's the thing right now? Like what are they all talking about? They they do, you know, games and unicorns and, you know, <laughs> fucking crafts and shit like that. But you could tell by the way they're talking, uh huh, is it's starting to get closer to that. What's ten at what grade again? Tip fourth. For, okay. So my, that's right around there. Yeah, my first girlfriend was four. One's like yeah. fifth, sixth. That's yeah. when it starts to kick and, in. Yeah. And girls mature faster yeah, than right. boys, for sure. My daughter's light years. Yeah, I had a girlfriend in fourth coming. grade, but I was still scared of her. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fifth grade, like it was oh. like liked her. You know, sixth grade, you're like trying. Dude, to Dude, I had her. friends ask a girl out for me. Yeah, yeah. Like, we're we're considered going out. I never talked to her. 
Yeah, yeah. that's, that's <laughs> really weird. Yeah, some yeah. guys still do that at yeah. the bar. Hey, bro, bro, <laughs> can you go see if that girl yeah. likes me? Like, huh? Get a number for me. Yeah, dude. what the hell's going on here? I got to do all the work. But it's funny watching them. You know, watching my daughter grow up and then start to, re, you know, just realize that it's going to be different pretty soon. And it's going to be a little bit. I'm watching Doug go through. Oh, you know that yeah. with his his, his oh, almost teen daughter, poor, poor bastard. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. just a skit. Yeah, because yeah. Bri- Brianna's getting ready to go to high school, right? Yeah. Yeah. So she is thirteen now. Yeah. Same. yeah, yeah. So it's, you're, you're a, it's a real it, joy. Doug. Let yeah. me just say. Yeah. 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 And do you walk into here in like boy conversations, like talking about boys yet? Have you? I had really to... don't hear those conversations. Okay. I think she has mm. those without me in the room. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's smart. It's so funny. My my uh, Jessica's friend has a daughter that's twelve. And she recently had to take the doors off the, the her bedroom door off the hinges because <laughs> oh, wow. she was hiding doing shit behind her back, you know. Yeah. And I'm just I have a very you know once you start to get older you start to realize your your own weaknesses whatever you want to call them, and I am a bit overprotective. Let's be honest, I'm a little bit on that overprotective side. And boy, does that spark that fire inside of me when I start to think of my daughter becoming a teenager. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where I start to oh yeah. You know, sure you know? glad I had a boy. Oh, oh man, it, Justin did it right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> two yeah. boys, dude. Tune done. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I was reading some um, some articles over the weekend on, you know, I've I've worked with. Have you guys ever worked with clients that have had just symptoms that they just can't pinpoint the cause of? And you've tried, you've gone through different routes. They've seen doctors, they've seen other specialists, and it's just they can't figure out some of their symptoms and the symptoms are not specific. They're like fatigue or it's you know. almost always those clients. It, it ends up being sleep and stress. Really? Yeah. Mm. Related to something like that. Like that's whenever I can't figure it out, like a diet and, and workout routine and everything else is like, seems perfect. And we're, we're hitting that, but they still have got stuff going on more often than not. It's either some sort of a, a stress, whether that be like, uh, emotional stress from like personal relationships or work relationships mm-hmm. or just stress on the body, like not sleeping well, staying yeah. up all night and like, I agree. Work. I agree. But I, you know, I had a client a while and the reason why I'm bringing this up is I have a, uh, a friend of mine who's, uh, whose mom was having some of these symptoms. And so, you know, we'll text each other back and forth and he'll ask me my opinion and, you know, and all that. And it's just kind of been this big kind of mystery. And I agree with you, Adam, usually when you, when it's not diet, it's not, you know, exercise. Uh, you know, exercise or any medical issue that's it's obvious. It's usually stress or sleep. So, you know, this poor woman has been going down that path and she finally found out what the issue was and she had some heavy metal um, uh, buildup, toxicity. Oh, wow. And it was causing some of her symptoms. Oh, and wow. the symptoms, when you look at the symptoms of heavy metal toxicity, it's like headaches, mental fogginess, anxiety, depression, memory problems, digestive issues, you know, poor immune function, so it's, you know, getting sick. And it's like, those are so nonspecific yeah. that it's hard for you to- So you just been ingesting too many of these heavy metals? Well, so here's the, here's the thing about that. It's not super common, right? Well, how do you even test to find that out? How do you figure that out? You can get a test from your doctor, although getting one of those tests is very difficult because those symptom, the symptom, symptoms excuse me, tend to be so general. And the doctor may do something like, oh, you're just stressed. And you're like, but I don't, you know, I feel like I'm not stressed and I feel like whatever. So it's hard to get those tests. Uh, Everlywell actually does a home test now, which is a a heavy metal toxicity test. And it tests, you know, all the arsenic and mercury. Oh, I didn't know they had that. Yeah, they do. Is it new? No, they've had it now for a little while. Damn, I need to go through all their tests. Now. Yeah, and they've it tests all the all the common metals that you may that can that can, you might get from you know, things around you, your environment or food. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, you read articles like, remember, was it was a two years ago, how um, there was an independent uh, laboratory that tested something like 15 different vegan protein powders yeah. mm-hmm. and found like 11 or 12 of them had excessively high amounts of heavy metals in them, like far beyond what the limits were supposed to be. Yeah. So you could be one of those people. You could be supplementing with a supplement. And that you consider a health supplement. Yeah, and you're taking it every day. So let's say you take a protein, like a lot of people do. A lot of people in the fitness space take a protein powder every single day, for example. Mm. Not realizing, because these these metals don't come out of the body very well. Uh, I mean, if you have heavy metal toxicity, you have to go through a protocol to to get, get rid of them. Um, and so you might not know. And so you're taking, and this is why it's hard. You, let's say you're eating a, a food or a supplement and you're doing it for every day. 
the, it takes a while to build up. You may be taking the supplement for seven years and all of a sudden you're getting these symptoms. How are you going to know that it's your mm. protein powder? You know what I mean? Or how, because you've been taking it for so, so long. So it just like stays in your digestive tract? They, your body stores able- it. Wow. Yeah, your body will store it. Um, and uh, again, the symptoms tend to be that way. So I'm not trying to freak anybody out. Yeah. But if you are if you have a lot of these kind of general symptoms of malaise and you've gone through the traditional routes of trying to figure out what's going on, you've gone to your doctor, you're exercising, you think you're eating pretty well, you're not overweight, but you just feel generally like shit and you can't figure it out. Um, you know, the, I think the Everly Well um, test is it's relatively inexpensive. It's an at home test. I believe it's one hundred ninety nine dollars, and then with our discount, um, yeah. it's it's a lot less than that. I've so, heard a lot of functional medicine practitioners bring that up. You know, when they're tracing back, trying to find the root of what's causing all these symptoms, mm-hmm. like a, like heavy metal and toxicity. Oh, Doug just one. brought his up. Doug, what are the heavy metals that it tests for? Arsenic, bromine, oh, cadmium. You- Creatinine. Oh, oh, that mercury. Would, yeah, there you uh, go. Then there's iodine and what's the one you selenium. weren't? You have two that you weren't great on, huh? Yeah, iodine and selenium. I was deficient, and uh, those are those you actually need to have. Yes, and these other ones like arsenic, bromine, you, uh, cadmium, all of these uh, mercury. I'm I'm with, more well arsenic in range, please. fortunately. So mercury is another good one because there's some like if you look at the the what they would consider safe levels of like safe amounts of fish that high contain high mercury. Right. So if you read like the, the guidelines here in America, they're way lower than the ones like in Japan, Mm -hmm. like in Japan, they say, Oh, it's safe to eat this much fish. That's got mercury here. They say, Oh no, no, it's gotta be way less. Now I wonder why I wonder if it's because Japanese culture. So eats so much more fish. Then again, they're very healthy typically. Then again, their rates of mercury poisoning are higher probably, you know, due to that. So anyway, I just want to say that out there, there you know, there, there are at home tests you can do because, you know, Everly Well does a lot. There's a lot of different tests you can do, but there's one that is hard for you to get. So I, that's why, uh, you know, she, she ended up figuring that out for herself. She actually had a, a doctor schedule some of these tests and now she's going through the protocol. So kind of crazy yeah, though, that's right? A good one. You know, yeah, I mean, how frustrating is that? You know, you have all these symptoms for, cause she'd been dealing with like two years. Was yeah, this like an old story or is this something you were dealing with this weekend? No, that was something that I talked to him about last week, late last week. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Because so. this weekend I was, you know, you're talking about sponsors and stuff like that. I was actually got, I got two of my family members to order the Felix Grays because they, one of them was complaining about high headaches and the other one was uh, complaining about needing a pre- eye prescription now and never having issues with her eyes until she started a job where she was staring at a computer screen all day long. And it was funny because I was reading this article and they were talking about the average person now spends a minimum of 1,700 hours a year in front of a computer screen. Yep. That's so much, dude. Yeah. And it's crazy because we haven't we haven't seen this until this last like decade or two. Mm-hmm. And before that, you would never hear these things. So we're starting to see more and more of these issues starting to pop up. That's why I think a brand like Felix is so smart for being ahead of the curve because I think it's going to be, pers- I think it's going to be a standard thing. You're like, right. And you see Screens companies aren't going away. Well, companies like Apple and Google, they're already getting on board. I know they have partnerships with them because I think it's going to become a standard that if you sit in front of a computer for more yeah. than an hour or two a day, like it'll just be a mandatory thing that everybody It's almost does. like safety goggles when you're right. in any other industry. hundred percent. Correct. Yeah. You're a hundred percent right. Um, I have a friend who's optometrist, uh, gave them a prescription, gave them prescription blue light blocking, um, lenses specifically because she was complaining about, you know, eye strain or whatever. And he's like, mm-hmm. hey, you need to wear these because it's going to damage your eyes. Blue light uh, blue light in particular suppresses melatonin tremendously. Like when compared to other forms of light, um, like green light, for example, twice as long as green light. And melatonin is, is a big deal. Now, I'm not telling people to supplement with melatonin. I think that's got different applications. But melatonin deficiencies have been, uh, or, or low levels of melatonin have been, linked to higher rates of cancer. Mm. Melatonin's like it got really good anti-cancer antioxidant properties. This may be why people who have, you know, poor sleep or work night shifts, there it's considered a carcinogenic risk by the World Health Organization. Like if you are if you're a night shift worker or whatever, mm-hmm. it's actually they put it up there with, you know, other things that are, are known carcinogenics like smoking cigarettes, 
which is kind of wild, right? If you think about it. Well, yeah. I don't. I mean, I don't even work in front of a computer all day long, and I notice a difference just from the amount of usage that we use our phones. Mm. And so I can't imagine being somebody like my my two family members I was talking to this weekend. I mean, they have jobs where they sit, they get at a desk, they sit in front of a computer, and they stare at a computer a minimum of eight to twelve hours every mm. day. Yeah. With my brother in law, it was he was thirty six hours in front of a computer screen over the course of two days. Dang. It's like, dude, that's how does that not? Fry? Of course, that's got to have some. Of course, some it does. Of you. course, yeah. It's yeah. almost it. It, it kind of sucks in a way because now that I'm aware, it, when I'm not wearing it, it's like my. It totally affects my sleep, and I can and I could tell right away. Ah, I forgot to put them on like the other night. It's almost like when I, I figured out like uh, some of the the uh, like like a gluten or or one of these other substances where it's like I know specifically that's what caused like my heartburn. Now mm. you know, it's <laughs> like I wish I didn't know that. You know, because it traced back. Like, I had one beer and like. Ah, you know, it's like what somewhat it ignorance, psychosomatic. Yeah. yeah, yeah, dude. Uh, this is something else that's crazy. So, um, Sunday, you know, I went, went to church and I was the, the, the some of the, the speakers that they have there are so phenomenal, such exceptional communicators. And every once in a while, they'll bring up studies, which I think is really cool. And he brought up a study, this was, I think it was done by UCLA, that showed that people need a minimum of of eight to 10 meaningful touches a day in order to thrive. So wow. they actually did this huge study and they found that people who receive less than eight to 10 meaning, meaningful touches are, you know, not like you bump into someone. No, but a like, hand on their shoulder, a hug. Stuff like that. Yeah, friendly hand. Yes, right. and they showed that if it's lower than that, even if they when they control for other tickle. factors, that, <laughs> yeah. that people's health physical health actually suffers. Now, the whole talk was about- that We're such social creatures, right? Such social creatures. You know, the Soviets had some fucking messed up studies on this, right? Uh, so they did- I heard about this. Yeah, they did dark. some some studies where they had orphans who were born, like oh, babies. Oh, they intentionally kept them away they from- They told the nurses, feed them, make sure they're, they're warm, but don't pick them up, don't hold them, don't you know give them any touch or love. And we're going to compare this group to this group of infants that you actually pick them up and hug them and hold them. They're all serial killers. Weird. And the ones that didn't get touch, they were sick. Some of them died. They didn't didn't thrive. They actually, so those yeah. studies, which you, you would never repeat, right? You never do a study like that again. But we need that. And so what he was talking about was how important it is to show your kids like physical. So it's funny, right? I'm sitting there. And I'm, 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 you know, we're listening to this. I'm sitting and my son's sitting next to me and he's like, so, you know, especially fathers, you know, make sure I know it's hard, but some, you know, make sure you hug and kiss your kids and even your sons, especially grew up. And my son's rolling his eyes because literally, <laughs> literally I'm putting and my arm around kisses him. kisses me like yeah. every second. Yeah. Literally. I just finished kissing yeah. him on his face you know, right before the guy said that. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, and he's like, how many is too much? You know, he told me that. <laughs> how much is too much? threshold? Yeah, dude. I told him like, I don't give a shit how old you are, kid. Oh, You're no. going to get a lot of that. Oh, you know, yeah. That's that, that stuff as a kid, you probably, it, it annoys you when you're a young teenage boy. But then like when you hit your late twenties, or early thirties, that starts to come back around. You really appreciate that. Y yeah. You know, I don't. I grew up with it, so for me, it's not hard uh, to show that. But I know it's hard for a lot of, especially guys. If you you know you grow up and your dad either wasn't there or your dad was like you know the stereotypical dad who's just like you know, right. you know too, uh, too macho. Yeah, good, good job, buddy. You know that's what you get from your dad. Yeah. It's like how do, you don't learn that. So how do you do that with your with your own son? You know, I mean, with babies. But once they grow up, like how do you well, do even that? with babies? I can you can see the difference. I can see it within like the three of us, my best friends and I, who all have kids right now that are you know between the ages of four months and a year and a half, you can even see the way we interact with our children based off of how, how we received love, you know, growing up. It's very obvious to me. You, know, you can I know still hug and punch. Uh, you know, I'm just going to throw that out there. Yeah. <laughs> did you guys, yeah. did you, was your dad very affectionate with you, uh, Justin, yeah, like he physically? Was. Oh, yeah, he was. Actually, it was like annoyingly. So I was like, like your son, where mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, stop, dad. Ugh. You know, like, because he would wrestle and then he would, to, to get me to stop wrestling, because I was just like incessantly, like always like attacking him, you know, and he would just like, okay, dude, I'm just kiss you. I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> so that was like, it, it was totally a, a you know a very uh like hands-on kind of like you know like love he's trying thing. to see how he's gonna i don't work. know how he's to like, say this a real handsy <laughs> my dad was he's real a handsy, handsy guy <laughs> <laughs> but not in like a creepy way uh yeah no it was it was definitely like it so i i i've you know i've modeled the same things with my kids i have no problem you know like giving them love like that so yeah my when my when i was a kid um you know i because i grew up in a family like that and so my friends would come over 
and they'd see, you know, when I'd come home with them, because we're walking home from school, and my dad would be doing something in the in the backyard or the, the garage, and I'd go up to my dad and give him a kiss on the cheek, and my friends were always like, you guys like the godfather? This is like the movie, you know, whatever. And I'm like, this is, this is literally how we... You know how we greet each other. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, dude, uh, 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 Science Daily published uh, or put out—they're not the publishers of it, but they report another study on on heavily or what they call ultra processed food. Bro, the verdict is coming out and it's conclusive on ultra processed food. It's probably the main reason for the obesity epidemic. Yeah. hundred percent. What? I mean, we, we, we've all like speculated that. Well, sure. I mean, you guys, you know, you guys knew this as trainers, right? But we used to say it was fat. Fat was yeah. the problem. And sugar. Sodium. Only. Yeah. Sugar. No, it's carbs. No, it's none of those things. Yeah. It's ultra processed foods and how they, they make us overeat. Yeah. They and encourage so, more uh, intake. So I looked up the very interesting charts. Um, on uh, uh, on other countries and how they start to adopt a quote unquote Western diet, which is uh, you know a Western diet is uh, it's just it's really personified, I would say, or characterized by ultra processed food. That's what makes something a, a Western diet. So, like in Latin America or Latin co- uh, countries, they you know two generations ago ate very differently than they do now. So they were showing on this chart. The rate, the BMI, the average BMI, and how it went up, and the consumption of processed food mirror. Mm. It's a total mirror. As soon as they started consuming more of these processed foods, BMI started going up. You know, that's body mass index. And the more they consume, the higher it goes up to the point now where there's an actual number where they can show you exactly how much the consumption of heavily processed food connects to wow. obesity, heart disease. All this stuff. Wow. Isn't that insane? That is insane. Yeah. So it's not any, it's, that's it right there. That's why I always say, you know, I just, towards the back half of my, my career as a trainer, that was what I would teach my clients because it was one thing. You know, I have to teach them all this other stuff. It's one thing I focus on. Like, just remove those first and let's see what happens. And always, they would always lose like 15 pounds, 10, 15 pounds just from doing that alone. No, I just, I remember putting the same thing together and telling clients they could just, I'd give them a, a list of all the foods, which were all whole foods. And instead of telling them restrictions of, oh, count your calories or weigh this, be like, eat as much of it as you want. As long as you're in these parameters of these foods, go to town. And what would happen is they would lose weight. Naturally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you're eating whole foods, it's it's crazy how how much more difficult it is to overconsume. It's the body kind of just naturally tells you I'm full. You get palate fatigue. I'm tired of eating that. Mm. And so now you're not going to get shredded doing that. No, that's what, that's what I want to communicate to people. Like, yeah, of course you want to get a six pack. You get, there's a lot more steps uh, that you're going to have to take. No, but you take somebody who has been eating an, an, an ultra processed diet, like you're saying, or eats out fast food all the time. And then you tell them, you know, Hey, baked potatoes, steak, chicken, rice, broccoli, all fine. Go to town. You know, mm-hmm. when you're hungry, eat it, go eat off this. As long as you eat off this list of all these whole foods I put together, just stay away from all that other stuff. But Hey, if you're, I don't want you hungry. If you're hungry, go get, go get something from your list. And they would. They would lose a ton of weight that way. Well, it's interesting you bring this up. Did you guys hear where uh, CrossFit's new direction is? No. Oh, so I guess like in January, uh, the headquarters had like, I guess there's been this this whole uh, new new sort of uh, agenda that uh, Greg Glassman like met up, I guess, with uh, another, um, this other like physician who like medical physician who I guess inspired him to, to focus like completely on chronic illness. And, uh, you know, this is why he's been going after like Coca-Cola. Oh, really? And, like, so he's, he's been in like a, a lot of, um, legal, legal, like lawsuits and things with, uh, what was that other, um, uh, certification that not, not ACE, but, it was, it was the more medically. I remember. I remember. I can't remember the certification, but there right. were some issues there. But so that back and forth, they've, they've been kind of like attacking and, and, and counterattacking a lot of, uh, uh, you know, these these big sort of uh, institutions and, and, and brands and things that sugar based kind of brands. Are they trying to go more foods. mainstream? They're Is trying it? to go more mainstream and, and they're trying to, to make it more accessible for like the elderly and for the general pop. Mm. So uh, weird. It's, it's a very interesting shift. Which who would have predicted that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, I guess it's like causing all kinds of like uh, pilgrimage away from, 
from the brand. Well, I'm more and more too. I we have quite a few people that own CrossFit boxes or or uh, attend them or train at them that follow us, and I get DMs all the time uh, that they they their programming is changing too. Like yeah. every year, it's getting it, it's funny because real soon here, it's not considered crossfit to me anymore it's, it's starting to become personal training yeah mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's uh, getting when, closer to reasonable that's, right. <laughs> that's exactly what we talked about um in our earliest episodes where we talked about crossfit it was like either i just talk about it like it's a sport and that's it and we're training athletes and it's to, it's a competitive sport or if you're going to use it for fitness you got to become you got to scale back on the insanity a little bit and make it a little bit more. It's funny because he and and that was the most they're bringing. They're finally profitable with the games and like they're like starting to bring in a lot of money. And then like he just had this like sort of awakening, almost like he went on an ayahuasca trip or something. And he's had this <laughs> idea that now we have to go in this direction completely. And so it basically took all the money out of uh, you know the games, which was starting to become profitable, which pissed a lot of people off. Which is probably one of the best things that they. Did. Didn't they like, cut their staffing down like tremendously? Yes. So they're only down. To, I guess they're only down to like nine. They had like a couple hundred in staff at the headquarters, now, you, and they've like dwindled down. To do you guys nothing. think they're going to survive this, or do you think that this pivot is going to because they had such a strong base that was so connected to the way they did things before? Do you think that this is going to hurt them? Or well, help? where are they at with the contract right now? What are they on year five or six with Reebok? Because they signed a ten-year deal with them. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, they signed a ten-year deal, so they're—I mean, they're—they're going to be okay. And if their games are actually finally profitable, um, they're not going around. And, and what's happening is they're—they're—they're they're, uh, they're obviously listening to what's being said out there about all the injuries and poor poor programming. And I think that, like I said, the people that we, that follow and listen to us uh, share with me all the time, like that they modify their workouts and uh, adjust them and do mobility work before they start and. You know, it's more and more starting to look like good personal training. Yeah. So, you know, because of that, I think it will. I think uh, you know, a decade or two from now, uh, people won't think of CrossFit the same way that we looked at CrossFit at, at the very beginning and what mm -hmm. it was like. I think it'll be it'll look completely different than what it looked so like. So they have uh, another thing was they have this certification like they did with their crossfit level one or whatever but they're doing it with physicians so like these these they're like they're taking them through functional exercises and all that and trying to like get them to adopt that within their uh clinic oh wow which is interesting. that's actually kind of cool yeah well glassman is he's a pioneer he really is um he made a bigger impact uh in the fitness space than any single person that i know of in modern times he really did um and when you hear him talk about certain things the dude is very, very smart, very, very forward thinking. Um, so it'll be interesting to watch, see what happens. Yeah. Justin, you told me that uh, um, Google bought Fitbit, huh? Yeah. When yeah, was that? 2.1 billion. Holy wow. yeah, shit. Yeah, this is like I don't know, a couple months ago, I think. But yeah, they, that's a big deal. I mean, the like I guess because Apple's been like producing a lot of numbers with their Apple Watch mm -hmm. and has done you know really well. Uh, Google wants to get a piece of the game and and had you know pitched that over to Fitbit and and acquired them. Have you uh, Fitbit's watch looks like Apple's watch? Well, I bought yeah. that's what I got my daughter for her birthday. Oh, you did? I did a Fitbit one, huh? I did. I got her because you know why? Her friend has one, mm. and they talk about it all the time. You know what's funny? This morning she's like, "Can I walk to school?" Because if she's got the Fitbit, she wants to try. We'll see how long the novelty works. You know. Lasts. Yeah. <laughs> well, you it's know? interesting because like, what's their motivation? And, and a lot of it too is obviously the user data, like they're that right. they're acquiring with it, which then you know gets into the digital health realm where Google's like, how do we track where people yeah. are moving, and how do we track their heart rates to see how our ads affect them? I mean, that's the main motivation. It's not Bro, the product. They're not making the money there. You think, I, you think I'm making shit up no, right now? No, not at all. It's, it's think, think GPS. I mean, it's got GPS on it too, right? Yeah. So yeah. imagine when you know your daughter's walking by Target and all of a sudden a Target ad pops up. on And then it. they'll see what the heart rate yeah. did and they'll start to connect it all. Oh, that's like what I told shit. you guys what it's was like, going on like with all the, yep. the car dealerships. I told you that's what's going on with, all the, with them being able to track and see where your vehicle is going. Wow. I mean- Look at look at that article Doug pulled up there. It says some Fitbit users are getting rid of their devices because they don't trust Google. <laughs> oh wow. Oh, wow. That's so funny. Yeah. That's interesting. Big yeah. data. I don't think it's gonna hurt their sales. I think they're gonna sell more. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's more convenient for the consumer. I mean, there's always the people that are freaked out. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, it's always the people that no one gives a fuck. Like yeah. nobody's trying to got better back end support. I'll nobody gives a shit about what you're doing, bro. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like oh. nobody cares. Like everyone freaks out about that. At the end of the day, for the majority 
It makes it nicer. You want to you know when it matters? If you ever run for any kind of public office, they're going to find some shit on you. Right. They're Every, having from your Gmail. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, they yeah. save it. That's like, why it was free. Yeah. 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 Everybody forgets that. Like, oh, I use a free email yeah. service. Oh, they, you do? Yeah. 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 You run yeah, for office. Watching. All of a sudden, they're like, oh, this, uh, this blog you wrote back in 2004. Hey, it still won't be that big, big of a deal. How many did uh, Hillary get to disappear? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you just need to find Hillary's magician. Yeah, there's still ways, there, there's still well, ways around it. All that disappeared. Emails and some people. Yeah. <laughs> Our first question is from BR Porter23. What is the significance of body weight training when strength training and can it replace higher rep ranges with weights? It's actually a good question um, because on the surface, you think to yourself, you know, okay, I'm doing push ups. I can do 30 push ups. Why don't I just do bench press with a light weight that I can do 30 reps with? Um, am I going to get the same value? You're actually not. No, different. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of skill that comes from exercise, learning how to do a movement. And it's very valuable to learn how to move your body around versus move a weight around your body. Well, what, I mean, they both have tremendous value, just different. That's a closed chain and open chain. I mean, there's uh, having an open chain is, is uh, lots of value to have, having to stabilize the weight and space. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just flat out, it's just different. It's different and both are beneficial. It's not a replace or an either or it's i think both belong yeah they're complementary to each other right right yeah now as far as like functional ability they both have lots of benefit for functional ability but i will say this when you're first started working out or you're let's say you're a trainer and you're working with uh youth i like body weight movements to start with i think mm -hmm. learning to move your body around in space learning to control your body has so much carryover into everything else um, I think uh, m many routines place almost no value on exercises like that, partially because it's a skill that can be difficult to learn. Like you could work out all the time with weights and then go and try and do pull-ups and dips or you know a, a single leg. You might have enough strength to do a single leg squat with your body, uh, but you may not have the control and stability to do it. So here you are squatting five here you know I'm, I'm a person like that. I can squat you know, mid 300 pounds, have me do a single leg squat and I start to struggle because I don't have that skill. Which one do you think is going to, you know, talk to my functional ability out in the real world? Uh, they both do. So neglecting one actually takes away from your progress. As far as the muscle building uh, effects or the body sculpting effects, um, because it's different, because it's novel, throwing those body weight movements in, you will notice uh, better, uh, you know, muscle development um, in your body. Like dips and pull-ups. I like to see that a lot of people do those, but not enough people do those two exercises. Those are great exercises to get good at. Like get good at being able to do a pull-up or get good at being able to do a dip mm -hmm. um, and watch how your body, you know, starts to, you know, kind of develop. Um, and if you need any evidence of the aesthetic effects of body weight training, look at high-level gymnasts. You know, mm -hmm. these are people that, they use some weights, but most of the stuff they do is body weight. Yeah, and, and I think people aren't – like it's tough because you do have to get somewhat creative in terms of how to intensify uh, some of these movements uh, without weights and, and to be able to – um, you know, make these workouts more challenging after you get somewhat adapted to push ups, dips, and pull ups and whatnot. And um, but there's there is a lot of ways. Like you see these calisthenic guys that are out there doing stuff with bars and uh, like gymnasts, and there's levels to it that you, you can definitely get you know massive strength gains from, and and very very much more uh you know this this proprioceptive ability of of. Uh, understanding your body, I think, and, and being in your body a bit more than even with weights. Hey, didn't you, weren't you scheduled to do some parkour with your son? I was, yeah. Did you do it? Yeah, you're like there's there's this waiting list that's crazy right now for it. So what? we went to the gym and we didn't even get to run the class yet. So we're on like for three weeks uh, waiting to do this. But I can't wait. It, it looks it looks like a riot, dude. Like really? There's, yeah, there's all these um, different obstacles and things, and it's like Ninja Warrior uh, obstacles and things in there that you can jump through and climb and and uh, swing from and all that. So it looks like a good. Oh, time. that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Next question is from J. Nick Dave. Should someone who's a beginner focus on bulking or cutting first? How do you know which to do first? 
You know, this is a general question, so of course it depends on the individual. Yeah. But generally speaking, I think um, I typically have a client focus on bulking first. Now, I don't. I say that loosely. I'm not telling. I'm not having them bump their calories like crazy or whatever. I'm typically just trying to get them stronger yeah. before I ever try to cut any kind of calories because I want to work with a healthier metabolism or maybe maybe that's the wrong word. I want to work with a faster metabolism. Yeah. It's easier to get lean when your body's burning more calories naturally. And I want them to be good to performance-wise in the gym while I'm working with them. I, I think to, to establish some of these like compound lifts, I don't – you know, necessarily want to run them through a cut where like they're they may fatigue, uh, you know, more so than they would if they were fed. Yeah, you know, I I've talked about this before in, in old podcasts, but I'll bring it up again um, for listeners who might not have heard this. But there's a bit of a misconception when it comes to um, you know the best workouts for fat loss. A lot of us think I'm going to do the exercises and the workouts that just burn tons of calories. But that's completely negating the fact that the workout itself sends a signal to the body. And the signal that it sends to the body tells the body to get better at whatever you're doing. And so what happens when you're focusing on just losing weight, and let's say you're doing lots of cardio, lots of these hit style workouts and circuit type training, is your body starts to become efficient with calories. You actually start to slow your metabolism down. And for people who are like, oh, that doesn't really happen. I've read studies. No, no, no. Look at modern hunter-gatherers. There's this really amazing study done on on modern hunter-gatherers, uh, the Hadza tribe, or Hudsa, I believe is, is spelled, uh, tribe, where they they scientists went in and measured their calorie burn, and the, they predicted that these these people would be burning 5,000 calories a day because they're hunting and walking and moving all day long. They thought, oh, these people are going to burn way more calories than the average person. It turns out they weren't burning that many more calories than the average person. And you think to yourself, how's that possible? They're moving like crazy. Because it doesn't make sense. Why would the human body evolve to burn shit tons of calories all the time when food has always been so scarce? Now, there is one form of exercise that will tell the body to burn more calories, and that is resistance training, strength. Because strength, when your body prioritizes strength, the second priority is to become efficient with calories. It actually bumps it down the list a little bit and says, we need to get stronger. In order to get stronger, you have to build muscle. That burns more calories. So more often than not, if I had a client that wanted to lose a lot of weight, I would even I would start them off and be like, well, we're going to focus on strength for a little while before we even try to lose any weight. It took me a while to figure that out. But once I started doing that, I had much better long-term success. I like this question because um, not only do I agree with you, but I would always uh, start someone to bulk up. The only exception to the rule would be a competitor or somebody who has already been tracking their food and they came to me and said, Adam, I'm at 5,000 calories a, a day already. I, they have all their macros tracked out for me. They're already eating a ton of calories and they're like, will you help me get shredded? Like, And that's like one in a you know thousand people come to me ever like that. Most people uh, are coming to me with nowhere, no clue where to start and or you know, somebody who's really overweight. And that's what's really changed for me uh, as a trainer. And it, it took me probably a decade to figure this piece out because you, the, the, I think the common knowledge says, oh, okay, somebody who is 300 pounds, they come and hire a personal trainer to lose 100 pounds, you're going to put them on a cut. No, not at all. Because most of those people have extremely uh, slow metabolisms because they're deconditioned. They're not moving around. They don't. They have a lot of body fat. They don't have a lot of muscle mass on their body, and and have probably real poor eating habits where they you know uh, binge like crazy and then they restrict. And so when I first get a hold of anybody, no matter how overweight they are, the first few months minimum is focused on us actually starting to slowly increase calories. Now I ch change them right. Most people come and they're they're. You know their macro profiles way off. They're way over consuming sugar and carbs and and sometimes fat. Not getting enough uh, protein or not getting enough healthy fats. Not getting enough fiber. So and we've talked about this on the show many times. Like I don't like to take away it from somebody. Somebody who also has a hard time controlling their diet, going straight into a diet that you restrict from them is always a really bad place to start. They have a lot they need to work on as far as their relationship with food. And I've found that I've had a lot more success with 
assessing a diet and instead of telling them, oh, you can't have these things, saying, hey, I want to add this into your diet. And so I'll add things to the diet while also strength training uh, to what Justin and Sal's point was, which is so I, I would build more muscle, which would then speed their metabolism up. So always uh, I'm starting somebody on a bulk before we go to a yeah. cut. Plus it's nice to show somebody that, to value or to teach someone to value performance first anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's like they came in there, they want to lose 30 pounds, but now you're getting them stronger and then they start to feel stronger. They start to see the weights go up in the gym. They start to feel better in their body. And then they start to value exercise for that. That's a nice relationship to start with. Like you're, you're valuing the performance and you're getting it. You're, you're starting off on the right foot. And then you know, a few months later, like you're saying, Adam, then switching them to now we're going to start to- Then comes the reveal. Yeah. And now we're yeah. going to start to, to reduce calories and, and, and see what happens. It's just a much better long-term approach. Next question is from Jeremy Longpre. Why do you guys think people have such a hard time losing fat in this day and age? What are the physical or psychological barriers you see most people have? And how have you guided people in the right direction on starting their journey? Do you guys ever look at the, the it's like a picture from, I want to say, it's like at the turn of the century. I should say turn of the, the, you know, the 1900s, right? There was a picture of a circus, uh, what they used to call the circus fat man. Oh, yeah. What the, what, what an overweight or obese person yeah, back then you, looks like you see to that like everywhere at Disneyland now. It's it's wild, yeah. right? Because you know back in those days, circuses had um, these these side acts or whatever, where you know come see the bearded lady or come see this you know the the you know the boy with you know you know flipper hands or uh, whatever or the three hundred pound man. Yeah, like the three hundred pound man was and, so crazy. Yeah, and then, so you look at this picture of this man who was considered a circus fat man. So people literally paid money to to stand in front of this guy and, and look at him because he was mm. so out of the ordinary, yeah. crazy overweight. Now, when you look at him, yeah, he's a big guy. He's definitely overweight. But you plug that guy into Walmart or any other you know store or, 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 scooter and, or Disney World, yeah. and he blends right in. And so it's, it's insane how much our perception of this has changed. Now, what the hell has happened? Is it because we're... Our, our, our genetics have changed? Is it is it just... No, it's our environment. Our yeah. environment has radically changed. It's a lot of things, right? I mean, it's... Uh, we move significantly less. Way less. That same time frame you're talking about, Sal, you would have to go slaughter the pig. You know what I'm saying? You would you prepare it all day long. You'd wash your clothes by hand. Yeah, I yeah. mean, there the, the amount of calories we were probably burning uh, throughout the day just to go about our normal day was probably 2, 3x what the average person uh, mm -hmm. does today. Not to mention, uh, food wasn't as readily available. Uh, you had to, you know, kick or kill, cook, prepare your meal just to have a single meal. Where yeah, door dash. Yeah, I mean, we, we have access to food everywhere. And then you throw in the fact of uh, how much we've made it palatable and, and processed foods like we all, we're all always talking about. I mean, we, we, we got wrappers and packages with, you know, three 500-calorie bombs uh, all over the place. And so it's really easy to over-consume in comparison back then. So I think it's a combination of all oh, you want to know what it, mm -hmm. you know what You want to know what it took to make food hyper-palatable 100, 150 years ago? It took hours and hours of preparation. It took a lot of time to make and bake the cake or the pie or the meal that was hyper-palatable. You had to put a lot of time and effort into it. They could not go to the store and cheaply purchase something that was hyper palatable. And here's the here's a funny thing, here's the reversal. You go back 100 to 150 years ago, the people that you found that were overweight were wealthy. Yeah. The poor were never almost never overweight. Yeah. Today it's the reverse. Today it's the reverse. Now why is it the reverse today? Well, Adam was saying, these foods are so readily available and so cheap and the reason why the wealthy now are not obese is because they've education. They're more educated, and so they make different food choices. But our lifestyle, it's just, let me put it this way. 150 years ago, 200 years ago, if you were to tell the average person that you were going to go to a gymnasium to lift heavy objects and put them down back on the ground, yeah. they would have been like, why? Yeah. Just go till the fields. Yeah. I got some work for you to do, and yeah. you, know, I, I'll, you, don't even have to, you don't even have to pay me for it. You know, yeah. It's crazy. Um, we are extremely sedentary, 
but also simultaneously extremely well, busy. We solved a lot of problems and we also created problems along the way. Side effects. That's just how it goes. I Un mean, yeah, unintendedly so. Like we, you know, to make everything easier in terms of access and, and, you know, food more readily available. Like these were mega, you know, issues that we we're trying to solve and, and solve hunger. Like hunger was a big, huge thing. And, and we, we were able to create foods that lasted longer and, you know, tasted better and, and do this all under uh you know for less money so it and now it's just it's it's everywhere so like learning how to create barriers for that is the new the new thing we i think do. that uh sleep and stress or you know the lack of sleep and high stress is at all-time highs when you compare it to back then also i don't think you had you didn't i think it was different stress I, I you know we have to be careful when we say that we're more stressed today because i i doubt <laughs> we're more stressed than the generations that you know grew up or were, were, they were you know yeah, tuberculosis you're, 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 was well, me. your stress back then was I might not get to eat. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah and so it was that. also it was also acute and then gone. Whereas now we have these like little stresses all day. Yeah. That's what I mean. We're, we're we take on everybody else's problems yeah. now. It's like every like we're, we're aware of like the world's issues yes. now instead and you, of just you, our local. And do you envision people back then uh, having trouble sleeping? I don't. I, I just don't see a hundred years ago yeah. lying in Not bed, when you're tired from labor, right? Job. Stimulated <laughs> from being on the computer all day long and your brain like turning all day long. I feel like most people back then are probably exhausted from their day. The sun went down. They probably sat by a fire or something, right. maybe had dinner, and then probably in bed. I can't imagine. And they had like crippling arthritis, like you know, at sixty years old or whatever. So you know, they had that. And that's the that's the other part too. When I say that we were were extremely, uh, we're also busy. So. You know, you think about this. What I mean by busy is we're distracted uh, constantly. There were probably times of quiet solitude back then. Like, all right, I'm going to take the wagon to go get some, you know, whatever. Uh, it's going to take me three hours. You're by yourself right. with your thoughts in yeah. nature, right? Now, you can't even wait in line for two seconds without being on your phone and learning about what's happening around the world and whatever. Yeah. So modern life is now here's now I want to be uh, clear here. I wouldn't trade it for, for old life at all. No. I think what we have now is way, way better. It just has what are called unintended consequences, these side effects of solving these major problems. So how do we fix that? We have to uh, create practices. We have to create practices. We have to, structure it into our daily lives and we have to learn to value them because learn to abstain yeah regular life modern life is not going to make you healthy and fit regular life is going to make you fat um, and chronically sick you might not get the same kind of illness as your grandparents got uh, but you're going to get these kind of chronic illness of you know inactivity and you know and, and overeating so you just have to kind of structure it in your life so now it's like you got to schedule time to go to the gym yep. otherwise you're not active now you have to avoid food whereas back then it was you had to find food mm -hmm. you know now you have to schedule time to be out in nature without all kinds of shit all around you all the time now you have to have a sleep routine you didn't have a sleep routine back then I mean, you know you hit the pillow you were exhausted yeah, that's how it's it like, happened you know turn the lights down. what lights you know yeah. <laughs> it's the sun that went down so it's just a totally different and if you look at uh places now where people are less obese it's because it's built into their life like if you look at like for example, you look at big cities like New York City, San Francisco, people tend to be less obese because uh, modern life there means you're walking more. You walk a lot. Yeah. You know, um, you look at you know certain uh, Asian cultures, they have implemented activity into their culture. So like you go to, you know, you see certain like Chinese culture, for example, old people are out doing Tai Chi and movements and it's just been ingrained in their culture. And so as a result, they have better health. You have to develop the structures, and it has to become behaviors, and that's the only way I was able to, to find, ever able to find long-term success with clients. Um, otherwise, it was always short-term success. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Rosa Steph. How do you know when you should become a personal trainer? What makes you fit to become a personal trainer? You, you know, I wrote an article on a, a blog article on this right here. In fact, I'll, I'll make sure that we link it in the in the show notes um, and. I wrote the article because there's a lot of people who uh, recently I've gotten a lot of inf a lot of messages from people who are asking questions like this one. Personal training is a a if you were to place jobs or careers into categories, there would be a category of passion driven careers, um, artist, musician, you know, chef, you know, personal trainers, right there. 
if you have a deep passion for it, you're going to be do okay. If you don't, don't become a personal trainer because the money's not going to motivate you. The job is not easy. It's not like you're going to do the job and be like, oh my God, I love hearing people complain about their problems <laughs> and I love people not doing what I tell them to do yeah. and I love hearing the same, you know, it's it's a it's one of those jobs that you love only if you're passionate about helping people through health you and fitness. You got to be a people person. If you don't l- have a passion for helping people through health and fitness, it, you won't last. And I've I've had many many trainers. You could tell why they got the job. Oh, I want to be a trainer cuz oh, the schedule seems flexible and it seems like a, you know, so I, I heard trainers make a lot per hour and I'm like you're not going to make it. I I feel like that's hard to t- say though because I also feel like I I fell in love with personal training and and became passionate about it. Like it was kind of like this, to be honest, it was a, oh, it'd be kind of a cool job to do while I finished my degree. It was like that. I really thought I was going to go down the physical therapist path and, and that direction. And uh, I actually didn't even know that you could make any money being a personal trainer and yeah. thought, oh, that's, and then when I found out you could, I was like, oh, that'd be kind of a cool job to do while I'm going to school for this. And I really fell in love with it. I really fell in love with uh, interacting with people and helping other people. And then I also, uh, and today when I think back, some of the things that m- make me so passionate about what we do is is honestly a lot of the accountability on myself. I value health and taking care of myself so much that it's awesome that I, I picked a career that it's you know, obviously, uh, ideal for me to be healthy and fit and in shape if I'm going to be promoting health and fitness. And so for me, that was like where a lot of the the passion later on came from was like, oh, this is, I'm a better person. I'm a better human when I'm healthier and fit and taking care of my body. And because this is where I make my living, um, it holds me accountable to that. And so, you know, it's you know, it's it's hard for me to tell you that you 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 have to have this like deep desire to be. Well, how soon did you feel? Because you still wanted to help people. You want to be a physical therapist. Yeah. But how soon did you feel like passion for it? Like how long did it take you? It, it was pretty quick. It was pretty fast. Like it, it, it. I mean, right away within the first six months, I was already like working six seven days a week, mm-hmm. and even when I wasn't, that to me that I, there was obviously obviously I enjoyed it a lot because. Even when I wasn't getting paid, I was still hanging out at the job. Yeah, same here. Mm-hmm. You know, and so that to me is like a good sign that you're in the right place. And it, you know, if you find yourself reading articles about you know uh, fitness and and the body and nutrition, like, and you find yourself doing that on off hours because you want to learn or your your interests or curious yourself, that's always a really good sign that that's probably a good passion for you. And I I think that it's not just personal training that falls with anything that you should pursue. Mm-hmm. I think that's just good advice in general. Like, you know, what would you do if you didn't need to work? You know, what? and I, and someone asked me the other day about us and this business and uh, what we're scaling it and potentially could build it to sell it. And and I go, you know, um, of course, uh, d- being smart businessmen, I think we're all structuring it the, to have the potential to sell if it wanted to at one point. But to be honest, uh, if someone asked me, what would you do if you sold this? And well, I would want to do this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I think that's what you should be in search of. And if you can ask yourself, like, would you, you know, and I was helping people like work out even when I wasn't fully certified and I was doing that on my, on my own time. So, you know, I, I don't know. I think that, uh, that's more important if you're, if it's something that you would do, even if you weren't getting paid, that's a good sign. If, if personal training for you, it interests you yeah. that much. Well, you know, when, when I do those sales trainings or for trainers, I'll be in a room full of anywhere between 20 to 50 trainers. And first thing I always say is, you know, uh, you know, raise your hand and tell me the reasons why you became a personal trainer. And it's, it's all, it's always something that's related to, I love helping people or I love fitness. I almost never had anybody raise their hand and be like, oh, it's it's for the money or anything else. It's definitely in the, in the reward, the value. It's, it's almost like talk. You ever talk to a teacher who's been a teacher for a year? Teachers don't make a lot of money. We know this. You ever talk to a teacher who's been a teacher for a long time? You ask them, why, why are you a teacher? You know, you don't make that much money. What is it? I love helping kids. I love teaching children. It's the same thing. Like the, the reward I used to get from clients coming to me and being like, you've improved, your, your guidance has improved my life, you know, and I'm saying in general terms, it was usually more specific, 
I would feel so good about that, that you could have paid me almost anything and I would have done it, right. you know? Yeah. I love it. I mean, it's one of those things. Uh, I always loved like PE for instance. And, and that's one of those where just being physical and being around it and learning uh, more about the human body and all the intricacies, you know, involved with that. Like it's just a constant place for you to learn and grow. And, and so to be able to then, you know, apply that to somebody else on, even on a small level where you feel like you're probably not qualified to do it for a long period of time, but like with the little bit that you do know, you can like immediately help somebody. And yeah. I think that's, that's the appeal of personal training. It's just like, you, you could just jump right in and, you know, as long as you're keeping everything safe and structured, like you can really make a huge impact in somebody's life. You, it's, it's one of the most, and people sometimes chuckle when I say this, but I, I'll make the case. It's one of the most exhausting jobs you'll ever do in your entire life. And people think, well, how's, how's it exhausting? You just tell people to work out. Um, you are, when you go to a normal job, you're there, you know, eight hours a day. Uh, when you're personal training eight clients a day, you are on every minute of that eight hours. You are not break with your buddies. You're not, you are on, you're with your client always. The energy that they give off, it goes inside of you, you know? So you have someone comes, it's not like your clients come to your workouts, always ready to work out and feeling great. Oftentimes they come to you and they're stressed out. Yeah. Oftentimes they come to you and they don't want to work out. And my wife did this. My husband did that. My shoulder hurts. I'm not feeling good. This isn't working, Sal. I'm trying to do the nutrition. I fucked up again. You know, I don't know if I should even work out, whatever. All, and that's it all day long. So eight clients in a day. You know what's funny? For personal yeah. training, full time is considered 30 hours. For most big box gyms, 30 hours considered full time. Well, That's because it's exhausting. Well, not only that, and if you're really truly doing uh, six to eight clients in a day, you, that's almost never is that eight straight. It's normally a block of four and a block of four, right. or a block of six and a block. So, uh, so you're probably there for 12 hours. Yeah. So you're normally there for a lot longer than a and then a normal eight hour shift in order to uh, see that many clients. Mm -hmm. So no, it's an exhausting job. And to your point, you're right. Like you, you have to be kind of a chameleon. You have to be a people person. Like. Those things I think are, are really, as far as the, the education and becoming a great trainer, I mean, that, that takes time. Like, I don't think, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think any of us believe that we were great trainers, uh, within the first year or two. I mean, it took years and years of experience to get really good at personal training. So if you're excited to learn and you're, you're into it, I think that that's important. I think it's important. You, you like people. Um, but as far as, you know, being fit to be a personal trainer, like who, uh, what, what skill sets or how good you are yet, like uh, that, 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 that doesn't matter as much as you your desire to want to be good. Yes, yeah, the passion. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download our guides. Uh, lots of free resources there. Check it out. Download it. You can also find all of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin, me at mindpumpsal, and Adam at mindpumpadam.